thank you very much, Peter, for agreeing to give a Yoga Soul seminar, and you can get started. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, first of all, Kate, for, for having me here. Uh, it's a pleasure to kind of be here in such a small group uh, and a group that is kind of composed of people that are doing fantastic work, which we're fans of pretty much everybody that is on this call. Um, I know I am. Um, and so I was excited when Kate extended the offer to, to present to you guys. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, my name is Peter Wynn, and I am a senior research scientist at the Wies Institute. Uh, over in Boston, and I'm also uh, in the, the laboratory of Jim Collins. So many of you might know us from a lot of our synthetic biology work. And so I'll be uh, kind of sharing with you today our work in freeze-dried cell-free synthetic biology in the Collins lab and at the Vs. Um, and we're going to be talking about things that are kind of on the interface of um, synthetic biology, living cells, and freeze-dried cells, uh, which are non-living. So we're right at the interface of living things and non-living things, which is kind of right in the area of where we need to be for this particular topic and this particular group. Um, so with that, uh, we'll be describing the, the freeze-dried cell-free synthetic biology work that we've been working on in our lab. Um, and I'm going to start off with living things. So um, living things, I'm sure everybody here has worked in, it works in a lab, and we all know that biology has its requirements. Um, that is, it needs to be fed, it needs to be watered, you know, whether or not you have a garden, or you have a lawn of E. coli, or you have mice in a cage. Um, I, what the, the, uh, the thing I, I like to kind of point out is that kind of being in a laboratory and working with living things is very much like having a pet. You 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 have to kind of main, make sure it's alive, uh, make sure it's happy, make sure it has enough heat, it's growing at the right temperature. Um, obviously pressure is not a problem and it's getting enough oxygen. And like I said before, you, you feed it water and food, right? And so that's normal for most people that work in biology or biochemistry, for example. Um, and of course, there's the other side of the equation, which is uh, cell-free systems, which we were very excited about about a decade ago, um, where you no longer have to have all of these requirements necessary, and you can work without needing to actually keep the thing alive. And this thing is actually considered just um, cell-free extracts. So for those of you that aren't familiar with cell-free extracts, it, it is what you know. It sounds like it simply is is a collection of cells. You break them open and you take out the insides of the cells. Uh, so basically, you, you you remove all of the the biochemical factors that goes into maintaining that cell, and now you're just you're just extracting that part. And so the cell free extract now is ostensibly all of the innards of the cells that are fully active, but now it can no longer replicate because there isn't a cell boundary anymore. Um, but the cell extract can still do some pretty amazing things. You can give it DNA uh, in the form of a plasmid, linear, linear DNA. You can even give it uh, RNA, for example. And when you mix the DNA or any nucleic acid information with that cell-free extract, um, basically you have the same biochemistry that happens in a normal cell. That is, you have translation and uh, uh, transcription if you're using DNA, and you get some kind of protein output. And we can use that output for diagnostics or uh, therapeutics. And so the fantastic thing here is you don't actually need to keep the cell alive for any long period of time. Um, you basically just need the cell free extract, and you can freeze that and mix it with the DNA at the point of care and get your protein out when you need it to when you need it to, uh, without ever having to worry about maintaining something that's living, uh, right? But obviously the the drawback is it's no longer self-replicating. So if you need more of it, it, it kind of doesn't work. Um, it's kind of a one-shot deal once you mix your DNA with the cell-free extract. It uses whatever energy equivalents it has, and that's uh, pretty much it. Um, and so what our lab found is that you can actually take the cell-free extracts and you can take the DNA and you can freeze dry the entire reaction. 
Um, and so when you lyophilize a freeze dry, you, you're, you're basically taking away all the water. So think um, instant coffee, if you will, or think ramen. Um, so that's basically what we're doing. And instant coffee or ramen, you can leave it on your shelf for, you know, years, right? And so it's still, it's shelf stable. It's still active when you mix the water in. And in the same way, the self-free extracts that are freeze dried also have that property. Um, you can leave it on the shelf. Um, you can transport it without uh, any water. So it's a lot lighter. Um, and it's shelf stable for a year. So up to a year, you basically have the self-free extract, which is fully uh, capable of self-free transcription and translation. And whenever you need it, you would rehydrate it. You would add the water back in and we were able to get um, protein output from that, uh, that whole process. And we've applied this to uh, basically point of care diagnostics and point of care therapeutics. Um, and so this is something that the Collins lab kind of seized on, uh, this initial find that you could freeze dry self-free extracts. And in the years since uh, 2014, 15, we've been applying this towards a number of different technologies. Um, and so quickly, I'm gonna go through what some of the advantages of these uh, freeze-dried cell-free systems are. Uh, one is it's highly transportable. Again, you, you removed 99.9% .9 of the weight, which is all water. And in the end, what you get is you just get a little bit of powder left over, which is all the, 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 the components of the cell-free extracts um, all the proteins and also some additives and energy equivalents that you you add into it to give it uh, enough energy to do what you need it to do. The next thing is it allows you to, to actually create things that you can initiate on demand. So normally for a cell, uh, a living system, let's say you needed, let's say you needed to get a particular protein, you would have to perform a translation, you would have to streak it out, you'd have to propagate it, you'd have to inoculate it. Um, here, you're literally just adding water in. So it greatly simplifies the entire process. Um, so you can do things on demand and have a protein ready within an hour or two. Um, it's very rapid. So the, the system takes uh, only one to two hours to produce everything it needs to produce. And then basically, once it uses all of its uh, energy, it basically just sits there until you either give it more energy or you purify it. Uh, from the system. Uh, it's also quite efficient. You can see here in this uh, image here, um, we have a, a self free freeze dried self free reaction, which we rehydrated with no DNA. And here we have one where we added in Venus GFP. And uh, as you can see, the, the Venus uh, fluorescent protein is actually uh, quite bright. And we're, we're the the efficiency of this biosynthesis approaches that of uh, cells and highly optimized reactions of up to above one gram per liter of uh, protein, which is, you know, uh, quite good for uh, protein synthesis. Also, because you don't have a living cell, you have greater biosafety. Um, that is kind of a no-brainer for these cell-free systems. Um, especially for things where you're using synthetic biology in the field and you don't want the, the prospect of a bioengineered cell escaping and propagating elsewhere, right? And so it gives us, gives us uh, uh, some level of safety in terms of biocontainment. And something I mentioned before is it's very simple to execute. You just add water. That's all the user has to do is add water at the right amount. Um, and you can prepackage the water. Uh, you can prepackage this with sterile water. So now you have a tube with your self-free extract powder and uh, a dropper that has your water in it. And you just add the water in and let it go. And a lot of these reactions work at room temperature, but they'll work even faster if you heat them up to body temperature. So you can put them in your pocket or either keep them under your arm for uh, for a while, and that should be sufficient to, to uh, uh, accelerate the reaction. And probably the largest benefit of these freeze-dried cell-free systems is that it completely circumvents the cold chain. So I'm sure you guys know when we order 
cells, when we order enzymes, when we order anything, usually uh, in our labs, they come, you know, packaged in dry ice, you know, frozen, and that whole system that requires a lot of energy and a lot of money to, to do that. Uh, by freeze drying these systems, uh, it actually completely circumvents the cold chain. And now you can transport things um, to be used for diagnostics and therapeutics completely without the need to refrigerate it. Um, and you can store it at the point of care without the need for refrigeration as well. Um, so imagine if you were able to do this, for example, for uh, vaccines, to develop vaccines, which I'll show you in a, in a couple of slides, we have done that. Um, so now you have this cell-free system where you can generate vaccines on demand right before you need to, to administer them. And the whole point of uh, distribution doesn't require refrigeration at all. Um, that would be fantastic and huge if we actually adopted that for, uh, for just one simple thing, such as vaccines. So what we initially started out with was using these cell-free systems um, for diagnostics. And what we did was we took freeze-dried cell-free systems and we actually spotted them onto uh, a piece of paper. You can see here, this piece of paper has a wax imprint on it. And each of these little dots here is a different cell-free reaction um, that we have uh, integrated into a piece of paper. And the idea is you would have your sample um, and you would add your sample to each of these dots. And depending on the kind of reaction you get, it would tell you whether or not you had uh, a particular kind of uh, infection or bacterium or virus in the environment. And in our first paper, we published um, work on uh, Ebola. This is an Ebola sensor using toll hold outputs. Um, to give us a laxy output. So now you're, you're, you're getting uh, translation and transcription of this laxy output completely using the cell-free systems. Um, this was able to detect Ebola RNA. Um, and all this work, the, 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 the very initial work um, that, that uh, where we found that these systems can be freeze-dried. This was all um, led by Keith Pardee. He's now a professor at the University of Toronto, uh, still working in this area. Um, and Keith basically uh, kind of was at the forefront of developing these first papers in, in the Collins lab. Um, the next paper uh, our lab kind of focused on was ex expanding that um, to Zika virus. This is when the whole Zika virus uh, worry came out. And here we're kind of showing the same thing. These are paper, paper-based freeze-dried systems. And as you can see, we can distinguish between Zika and dengue, which at that time, uh, antibody tests were not able to do. And so we were able to do this using uh, amplification. So we added an amplification now. Um, and so we were, using, we were using LAMP to amplify the RNA from Zika. Um, and then use the told reaction to give us a visual detection. And so this is a, a amplification combined with our freeze-dried cell-free systems. Um, and one thing we wanted to show with this paper was how long, how, how quickly we could develop these molecular sensors. Um, and so it took us only five days to do the entire, uh, from scratch, the entire design and development and isolation of these sensors right here. And the majority of the days um, was actually sent, spent waiting for the DNA to come in the mill. So we had to just wait for the DNA to be synthesized, essentially. Um, and once we had the DNA in hand, it took uh, almost a day to do all of the screening for this. Um, so you can have molecular sensors in roughly a few days, which is fantastic. The next thing we wanted to focus on uh, was biomanufacturing. So we can detect things. We can make a uh, point of care diagnostics. Can we expand this out to biomanufacturing now? And so I want you to imagine kind of a distributed um, way of doing biomanufacturing. The way we think of a biomanufacturing now is we have a very centralized factory or bioprocessing factory um, that a company will, will have. They'll produce 
some kind of biological component, enzymes or uh, antibodies or vaccines, for example. Um, and then that will be processed and packaged and then finally sent to where it needs to be, a hospital or a clinic. Um, and what we were thinking about was, you know, is there a different way to do that kind of biomanufacturing? Can you have distributed biomanufacturing where you essentially distribute or mill out the components to do the biomanufacturing and the instructions in the form of DNA to do that? And you actually do the biomanufacturing and purification steps at the point of care. Um, so it's it's a bit of a different uh, approach to how one would do biomanufacturing in our modern society, but we think it has a lot of benefits uh, and, and that I kind of listed out earlier. And so that's what we shared, that's what we, we explored in this cell paper in uh, 2016, which is uh, we wanted to look at on-demand biomanufacturing. And we, in this, we kind of uh, wanted to look at the breadth of the things that we could produce using this freeze-dried selfie system. And so all of these are freeze-dried and we just added water and the DNA that we, we needed to these freeze-dried systems. And we were able to get 15 functional antibodies out of this. Um, so these are antibodies against various pathogens that you might use uh, therapeutically or you might use the antibodies in, uh, again, a diagnostic that you might need uh, and rather wait for an antibody to be shipped to you. You would just spend an hour and, and get the antibody right there and, and then for you. Um, we also recapitulated uh, enzymatic pathway. This is the biolecin pathway. Uh, so biolecin is a, a, a chemical that is used, explored as an antibiotic or an antifungal or an antiviral molecule. And by having uh, five genes that you can put into one cell-free reaction, we were able to actually make those genes and recapitulate this enzymatic pathway um, to make this molecule from a substrate. And so you can actually do some kind of uh, bio, chemical biosynthesis using cell-free systems as well. Um, we also, uh, generated 10 different antimicrobial peptides. So again, we were exploring antimicrobials, uh, antibiotics. And uh, so antimicrobial peptides are these uh, peptide-based uh, antibiotics. And we were able to produce this on demand as well using the cell-free system. Um, and to cap it off, we generated four different vaccines from this. And we tested these in mice and they're fully functional. Um, so these are uh, protein-based vaccines um, at, where you would basically just add water to it, wait an hour, uh, purify the vaccines uh, using a, a simple column purification, a spin column purification. And then we injected it into mice and we saw the appropriate immune response. Uh, so this was for a diphtheria vaccine um, that, we, that we made here. Um, and with that kind of set, and so we, we've kind of showed we could do um, diagnostics, and then now we, we focus on biomanufacturing. We wanted to see now uh, other applications uh, that kind of utilize both of those. You know, uh, now we can do diagnostics and biomanufacturing. How could we apply that, right? Uh, beyond what we typically would think of, which is clinical applications. And one thing that Jim was really interested in was education. Um, and this was the next big push. This was back in 2017, 18. Um, and what we wanted to, to do was we wanted to uh, kind of push this into the field of education. Uh, one, thing, one thing we were thinking was, you know, doing this in a laboratory with very trained technicians or scientists such as, you know, you guys out there. Um, using these cell-free systems is, is pretty straightforward. You just have to be sterile, add the right amount of water, and, and, and it should work just fine. And we thought, well, the most difficult uh, environment to work in is a high school classroom. So can we have high school kids use these cell-free systems and actually do synthetic biology in class, right? So to do synthetic biology, in class, in a classroom, you normally you need a lot of typical laboratory equipment just to grow cells, just to, to do the actual synthetic biology, not even analyze what you're getting in the end. 
but you need an incubator, you need refrigerators, you need shakers, you need you need all this infrastructure that a lot of uh, schools you know can't afford. Um, and so that limits a lot of biology, uh, synthetic biology uh, in schools to kind of very, very limited experiments. And so can we use our cell-free systems to kind of address that? And so we uh, demonstrated, uh, we had these, uh, what we call BioBits kits, and these use cell-free reactions. We were able to make uh, cell-free systems um, using the cell-free systems that it, that uh, basically gives a fluorescent output to give the students you know, something visual they can see. So here you can see these are fluorescent cell-free proteins that are being expressed. And this is a handheld uh, fluorimeter Basically, it's just blue LEDs that we made, um, and it costs like about a dollar. So this is super cheap, and we have other reactions that we made. Uh, I don't have a slide here, actually. I forgot to put it in. But we had other reactions that we made, for example, that we uh, intended to be used in the classroom that used uh, a lot of our previous work and also um, explored new areas. So we made hydrogels using these cell-free systems. So you could just have a, an enzyme being expressed that will cleave a substrate and form a hydrogel. And so now they can form gels in class using uh, biosynthetic biology. Um, and we used a, a recapitulated enzymatic pathway, similar to what I showed for, for the biolecin. Um, and this time we did it for generating smell compounds. So you can have enzymes be generated using these cell-free systems and it would convert a substrate into something that would be uh, aromatic. So now you could smell things like pine or wintergreen. Um, and these are, you know, th th these kind of demonstrations were done in cells before, in iGEM, for example. Um, and we just basically converted a lot of that to uh, cell-free systems, freeze-dried cell-free systems, and optimized it to, to make it work. Um, and we even allowed these, uh, we even made a system, uh, a, a module, where these high school kids could perform uh, molecular therapeutics, uh, molecular diagnostics, sorry. Um, and they would basically get strawberry DNA and kiwi DNA, and they would add in these into a molecular diagnostic using these cell-free systems. And it would glow depending on if it were a kiwi or it were, were a strawberry. So it kind of demonstrates how you can do molecular diagnostics and identify things using their nucleic acid signatures. And they were able to do this completely in the classroom. And all you need essentially is uh, clean water, which we also packaged in with them. And so these BioBits kits right now are uh, being manufactured and distributed by Mini PCR. Um, and so they've been rolling out since 2018 and they're used in classrooms right now. Um, I think uh, we're we're at the level of almost hitting a thousand different classrooms. Um, and the latest advance with the BioBits stuff is right now it's actually in space. So we were selected for the genes in space. Uh, this is a kind of a NASA program sending things in space, genes into space to explore uh, biomanufacturing and just general synthetic biology and biology in space. Um, and so our BioBits kits were sent into space to demonstrate that you could do cell-free systems in space for biomanufacturing potentially in the future. And it was sent along with a mini PCR system. And this is the new version of that uh, handheld fluorescent fluorimeter that I, I demonstrated before. Um, here you can see it's, it's now made of cardboard and it's a lot more efficient. Uh, you, it's very nice. There's no background uh, light at all. And so all of this was set in the space and we just got first data back in, I think a, a week ago actually, showing that, you know, as we expected, the selfie systems work just fine in space. Um, so the, the most recent thing that we've worked on is actually uh, synthetic biology in textiles. So this was just published last year in Nature Biotechnology, where we developed fabrics and we integrated selfie systems into that that are freeze dried. And this allowed the fabric to actually 
have a lot of the diagnostic properties uh, that we were developing just in a tube, for example, or on paper-based diagnostics. Now we're actually integrating it into wearable devices. Um, and so these fabrics can detect, uh, for example, viruses or bacterium um, and alert you to whether or not you've been exposed. And so the inspiration for this is uh, kind of our own skin, essentially. Our, our skin can, can detect and adapt to a number of different things. And it does this using uh, biology because that's what it is. Um, so it's bio, a, a huge distributed biosensor, uh, essentially, that is covering your entire body. Um, and we wanted to do the same thing because what we, we, we were thinking, uh, what we wanted to explore was, you know, clothing hasn't really evolved that much uh, since we first started weaving cloth, right? We've added different materials into things. Uh, we've woven it different ways. We've added in, in, in other functions into it. But in terms of biosensing, it's still uh, something that's not capable really of biosensing. And so we were trying to see if we can uh, develop a system that would blend uh, artificial clothing with something that is um, a, a biosensing diagnostic. So can we blend something? Can we, can we kind of uh, explore that area, the interface between something that's not quite living which is clothing and something that has biochemical properties, which is our, our cell-free biosensors. And it's, you know, these two areas, synthetic biology and wearable technologies, um, they're not very compatible. So synthetic biology, obviously, typically you need living things, very complex functions, um, and a lot of, you know, benefits in terms of using cell-free biology, cell biology for that, such as programmable modularity. Um, and wearable technology, again, it's highly portable, um, but, you know, it's not very amenable to maintaining a living thing inside clothing, right? Although there have been, uh, other groups have tried to do that. They've tried to integrate in living cells into, into wearables uh, that are engineered to do a certain response, for example. And so what we wanted to explore was, can we bridge this, the, this gap between uh, synthetic biology and wearable technology using cell-free synthetic biology. Um, and in this, we basically are creating um, little areas in our, the, our prototype wearables that house these freeze-dried cell-free reactions. And when you're, for example, exposed to something with, a, with an aqueous splash, um, that splash will actually rehydrate the reaction and also run the reaction for you and basically give you an output to tell you whether or not you've been exposed to something. Um, and one of the key things, so uh, I, I'm basically going to show you data that where it's actually working, but for, I would say, six months to a year, a lot of our uh, research on this area was focused on very basic things like how do you get water to wick in and hydrate this cell-free reaction and then not evaporate too quickly, for example. So evaporation was a huge thing. So you have to fight. You want hydration, but you don't want too much hydration because it dilutes the reaction. Again, uh, you don't want, you want hydration, but then you don't want evaporation. So you need to fight evaporation. Um, so there's a lot of those kind of practical concerns that we had to deal with um, in getting the system up and running. And so here we are, we developed a prototype based on a silicone elastomer that people do use for clothing. Um, and we basically simply added in, this is one of our first prototypes, a cell-free system here into uh, a substrate that is integrated into that uh, flexible prototype. So you can see here, it's very flexible. We have these uh, portals that rapidly wick in any liquid that's on the surface. Um, and you can actually design this with channels that can that direct everything to these portals um, so that these reaction chambers uh, basically draw in water from the outside. And once they're fully rehydrated, uh, and this this hydration takes only a few seconds, then these reactions are actually fully functional. Uh, and mind you, this is not 
this is done uh, where we're, we're in a lab. We're basically just adding the water directly onto the, we're dropping water onto these prototypes and letting the water splash and activate certain reactions. Um, and then we're just monitoring uh, how the cell-free reactions uh, proceed. And as you can see for these, you can, this is a constitutive reaction just to show you that the cell-free system itself is active. Within one hour, you get a conversion product that you would expect based on our substrate. So this is lac -Z here, which gives you that purple color. And here's an actual toll hold switch. Um, and so we're putting in this toll hold switch encoded in DNA into our sulfur reaction. And the water has Ebola RNA uh, spiked into it. And the sulfur reaction can actually react to the Ebola RNA and give you a color metric output. So the idea is, for example, you would wear this on a laboratory coat um, and we could program the sulfur reactions that you would integrate into your clothing for whatever uh, you know bug you want to detect. In this case, we're looking at Ebola viral RNA, but we could uh, easily reprogram this for any other kind of virus or bacterium. And so this is one of our first prototypes, the color metric prototype, and it had limited use. Um, the, 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 the advantage of this is that it's visual, so that it's just changing color. You don't need anything else to see what the output is. However, because it's a visual output, you need to check um, to see what it is. So it's, it's limited in use in the way that, for example, if you were splashed on the sleeve, and it changed color and you didn't know you were splashed, um, you wouldn't actually find it until later on. So we wanted to see if there was something else where you could get a quicker response, and not only quicker, but a response where it would be integrated into a system where it would alert you that you were, you were splashed. And so that led us to our floor metric prototype. And so in this floor metric prototype, what we've done is we have basically created excitation and emission layers of the wearable where the excitation light and the emission light is actually carried by flexible um, polymer optic fibers. So these optic fibers, they're not like the glass optic fibers that you you normally think of. These are polymer optic fibers. They're, they're more uh, akin to, for example, if you think of a fishing line, so it's very similar to that. And we found a, a partner that worked with us to actually weave these polymeric optical fibers into fabric. So it's actually woven into the fabric itself. And by hooking it up to an uh, LED, you can do the excitation and then hooking up the, ex the emission optical fibers to uh, an optical camera, you could actually detect the uh, the emission from your selfie systems. And the selfie systems themselves are actually integrated directly into the, these fabrics right here. So the excitation and emission fabrics, you can see they form a little sandwich. And the, the selfie systems, we integrated into that and, and freeze dried that into the, the entire system. And all of this is integrated into one, uh, one single layer of fabric. So it's all fused together. And we do have portals on these. Um, and so the idea is kind of the same. You have a splash on the outside. It basically goes into these layers until it hits the cell-free layers. The cell-free system becomes rehydrated. Your diagnostic reaction uh, becomes activated. And once you get a fluorescence or a luminescence output, the excitation and emissions uh, fibers actually detect that. And so what we have is we have this distributed system in the fabric that's constantly uh, pulsing excitation uh, light and also looking to see if there's a response. And it does this you know, at whatever frequencies we program it to. And in this way, for example, if you, again, you're splashed on your sleeve, um, it would actually detect this. Uh, it would detect the fluorescence and it would actually alert you um, through this simple, small computer that is basically the size of a candy bar, and it would actually ping you on your cell phone. Um, so it would it would actually alert you on your cell phone and send you a text message or uh, some something like that. Uh, 
in our app that we made, for example, and it would let you know the sensor on your wrist has been activated. It's showing a fluorescence of this intensity that indicates a potential contamination with this uh, bug that we uh, we were using for our sensor. And here is showing um, an actual actual data from the sensor. So uh, what we're showing here is GFP sensor. Uh, this is a, a straightforward GFP. So, sorry, this is not a sensor. This is a constitutive uh, DNA that's just expressing GFP. Um, and it's just a simple rival switch that is being induced by a small molecule. So these can also be used for a small molecule detection as well. If you were exposed to some kind of toxin that has either a transcriptional sw switch to it or a rival switch, for example. And in these images, what you're looking at is you're actually looking at the ends of the optical fibers um, that are coming straight out at you. And so each one of these is an optical fiber. Um, and these optical fibers terminate in the clothing at different reactions. And so you can see here uh, over time, going time is going from left to right. Um, these optical fibers are transmitting uh, the fluorescence from the sulfury reactions once they've been activated by a sample that we splashed onto the system. Um, and without any splash, you don't get any fluorescence at all. Um, and as you can see within 15 to 30 minutes, you start to get signal from, this is the this is a theophylline rival switch that we put in uh, and spiked into our system. And as, as you can see, we get very good fluorescence signal. Um, by an hour, you definitely get a very high signal and it, it keeps on going after that. Um, and we also demonstrated, you could use rival switches to detect uh, virus RNA, for example. This is an HIV toll hold switch. And at the end of this, we have luciferase. So now luciferase is our, out, our reporter gene. Um, and uh, our cell free system is able to, once you we have HIV RNA spiked into the system, it's able to activate this toll hold switch and produce uh, luciferase and give you a luminescence output. And as you can see here, this was actually our fastest biosensor. Um, again, this is completely on the wearable. This isn't done in a laboratory on a tube and then extrapolated in any way. This is just in our prototype. We just had uh, a, a bunch of HIV, 10 micromolars of HIV RNA that we just threw directly onto the prototype and let it absorb naturally. Um, and as you can see, within five minutes, you get this luminescent signal that uh, is, is very clear, peaks at 15 minutes. And obviously, because you're using um, all of the, the, the substrate, um, the luminescence goes away. Um, and so it peaks within 15 minutes and within 15 minutes, you're basically telling the user whether or not they have been exposed to HIV. And so the idea would be to use this again for cases where you're exposed to uh, HIV or Ebola or anything you want to detect um, and would want some kind of sensor integrated onto your clothing. We also adapted our selfie systems for more simple uh, reactions. So these aren't sulfur systems, but these are uh, wearable CRISPR sensors. So this is just using uh, Cas12a or Cas13a CRISPR sensors. And so the CRISPR sensors, basically these can be freeze dried as well. Um, and they're much more versatile than the cell-free systems in that they, uh, they're, they're faster. And due to the molecular recognition, they're much more efficient. Um, and so these systems work by um, the, the CRISPR systems, once you give it the programmed gRNA that you want, uh, the target molecule, once you get exposed to that, the CRISPR enzyme, once it gets rehydrated, will activate once it detects that piece of DNA. And the activation causes um, the activation of a collateral activity of the CRISPR sensor, um, where it starts to become a nonspecific nuclease. And we can leverage that nonspecific nucleus activity to cleave a fluorescence probe. So you can see here, this is a, a fluorescence probe that's quenched. And once that is cleaved by the CRISPR sensor, you have fluorescence. And so it's a fluorescence on biosensor 
uh, using the nuclease activity of certain CRISPR enzymes. And we can detect this again in our wearable system uh, using the same wearable that we have before with our excitation and emission uh, optical, optic fibers. And here we're showing that you can use these um, CRISPR sensors for, to detect uh, these are antibiotic resistance genes for Staphylococcus aureus. So these are genes that are responsible for MRSA, for example. So we have MECA, SPOT, and ERMA. These are all different uh, antibiotic resistance genes that are propagated uh, and are of clinical relevance. Um, people do want to detect this in the clinic. And as you can see with these sensors that we have, each of these sensors, we have three sensors right next to each other and they're connected. Um, and what we're, we basically have is we have CRISPR sensors detecting each specific um, gene here. And you, as you can see, it's highly orthogonal. Only the CRISPR sensor that is hydrated, that is detecting the specific gene, lights up when we give it that gene. And the orthogonality is, is, is quite uh, good, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to use CRISPR sensors for our system as well. And the last thing we worked on for our wearable synthetic biology was a demonstration for COVID-19. So we were shut down for COVID-19 in the middle of this paper, and we decided to adapt our system for COVID-19 detection and diagnostics in that system. And so what we developed was a nucleic acid diagnostic um, that is point of care that is fully integrated into a face mask. And so the system here is non-invasive. Um, the, the user would just breathe into the face mask as you normally do when you're wearing a face mask. Um, and viral particles accumulate on the inside of the face mask. And our, our initial idea is, um, this is back in 2020 when testing, this is a very early in the, the pandemic when testing was very limited. Um, and basically nucleic acid tests were, you know, you would have to wait days on end for a nucleic acid test just because there was so much demand and, um, antibody tests were not, they had not been developed yet. And some doctors came to us and asked us about whether or not we could develop using our wearable system, uh, a diagnostic. And the idea was, well, if you're using a face mask and you're already breathing into the face mask. If you are infected, that is a lot of sample on the inside of the face mask that at the end of the day, you're just throwing away. Can we use that sample and have it used as a diagnostic while the patient is wearing the mask? And so you would wear the mask, it would protect everyone around you, um, and it would also do double duty by diagnosing you whether or not you had COVID-19. And so this would be fantastic for triaging patients, for example, when uh, during stages of the outbreak when they had patients coming in that didn't really, they, they couldn't diagnose them fast enough to triage them and put them into the COVID ward. Um, and so by putting on the face mask, which you need to do anyway, you can actually just diagnose and then triage them uh, very quickly. And so see, these are the parameters that we wanted again. So it's non-invasive. We wanted to detect it from the breath. We want it to be simplified. So the whole system would require no electronics, or power. So this would not require uh, any batteries, for example. We want it to be very sensitive. We want it to be comparable to RT-PCR. So at the time we developed this, WHO had just come out with their RT-PCR guidelines, and we want it to be as sensitive as what the WHO put out for RT-PCR, which would require you know, a laboratory instrumentation to do. And we also want it to be programmable. So, for example, if uh, mutant strains came out, which obviously did happen, uh, we could use CRISPR-based sensing and just swap out the gRNA to focus and the focus our sensor on detecting different variants. Um, and so, this is a very high bar that we set for ourselves, and I'm glad to say that it surprisingly uh, worked. Um, and so, this is the end result that we have uh, of our of our the parameters for our COVID-19 mask. So it, it, it was sens sensitive. It was comparable to the RT-PCR system that uh, the RT-PCR guidelines that the WHO put out. Um, 
no power, complete point of care solution. So it takes 90 minutes to get the result. It's a bit longer than we had hoped for, but that uh, is just due to the, the way it works, which I'll show you in the next slide how it works. It's super lightweight. It only weighs one gram. You don't even feel the difference on a face mask. Again, because these are all freeze dried, it's shelf stable. So you can store these masks at room temperature. Um, it's highly programmable because it's crystal based. And uh, you know, a very significant thing is it's very inexpensive. So the add-on cost of the entire thing on, onto a mask is only $5, which is you know the, the price of an expensive cup of coffee at Starbucks, right? And so you're getting a COVID-19 diagnostic for $5. Um, and we think it's a pretty good deal. And uh, so that's $5 unoptimized. And we're buying enzymes that we use, you know, from companies that are, that raise, that have very inflated prices. And so just doing an analysis of that, we think we can get it down to a dollar uh, per mask if we manufacture this and optimize the whole process. So this is how it works. And this is what the sensor looks like. And so you're looking at the inside of the mask. Um, and this entire sensor is integrated. And what you have is you have a reservoir of water. This contains the water that actually rehydrates the entire system. And so this is in a reservoir where it's activated and it pierces a septum. Uh, so all you do is press, press the button to activate the whole system once you're ready to, to diagnose the patient or the user. Um, the button pierces the septum, the water flows through a sample collection zone. So this is placed right in front of the mouth and the nose, and this is what you're breathing into uh, during the time that you want to collect the sample. Um, and it's a large sample collection zone. We went through a lot of optimization to look at the, the kind of materials that you would need that would actually bind to aerosol particles and actually wick in water from the reservoir using capillary action. Um, and so we were able to find a great material that was able to do all this. Um, so it basically draws a sample in and the sample would hit each of these reaction zones after it draws in uh, the viral particles, for example. And each of these zones are typically what you would do in a laboratory when you're preparing a sample. You would do lysis, for example. We have a lysis zone here. And each of these zones, we, we spent a month or two to optimize to make sure that it works. Um, so this contains compatible detergents with everything else downstream. And it would break apart the viral particles. We have these time delays that are built into the system as well. Um, and then next, you have uh, RT-RPA, which is uh, there to amplify up the viral RNA. And then you have your Cas 12A or 13A Sherlock um, here in your final zone. Um, and that Sherlock is integrated so that the probe, when it's cleaved, actually gives you a lateral flow assay output. So now instead of fluorescence, which we normally do with our Cas di diagnostics, we're able to adapt it for a lateral flow assay output. And so this gives you basically very similar to a pregnancy test, you get one band or two bands, depending on uh, your positivity for the whole system. And so this took us uh, about nine months to optimize and to get just right. Um, and in our hands, it works quite well. It's quite robust. And so these are actual face mask sensors that we um, spiked in. Uh, we basically uh, aerosolized and using a nebulizer, um, SARS-CoV-2 RNA, uh, that's our target. And as you can see here, this is a, the, the T to C ratio. So the T is a test band, the C is the, actually the control band. And uh, when you have one band, that is actually considered a positive for this particular test. And when you have two bands here, um, you basically have, uh, that is the no template control, which is no, you're not exposed to any uh, SARS-CoV-2 RNA. And as you can see here, the sensitivity of this is down to several hundred copies of uh, SARS-CoV-2 RNA in the aerosols that we're piping into the face mask. And so each data point you see here is a separate face mask that we, we kind of assembled and designed. That was the most arduous process of this entire project because each face mask had to be handmade and hand-assembled 
And this entire thing took many, many steps to make. And so as you can imagine, you're, we're making like hundreds of these by hand. Um, and we're getting all of these data points from that. Um, and so uh, it was fantastic in that it actually worked. And this threshold here that you see, only several hundred copies target, that is a threshold of the WHO RT-PCR tests. And so that's the, the, the threshold at which you, um, they're saying it's a reliable test. And um, just to point out, one other thing I, I do want to point out is when you use these CRISPR-based diagnostics in the tube, so not in our wearable system, but purely in a test tube under the most optimal laboratory conditions, you get down to single molecule uh, copies of target detection. It's, it's very, very, very sensitive. Um, and so we do take a hit in sensitivity, but it's enough for us to hit that WHO threshold for um, for use as a diagnostic. And because it's a CRISPR-based sensor, it's highly specific as well. Um, so you can see here, it's specific only for SARS-CoV-2. Other human coronaviruses that are normally circulating don't activate the sensor. And you see two bands here for all of these. These are representative uh, lateral flow assays, for example. Uh, one thing that I want to mention that might be of relevance for those of you that are doing selfie systems and trying to integrate them into artificial cells is that as part of our work, um, going back to selfie systems now, so these are, again, these are pure systems, uh, NEB pure systems, where you have the translational and transcriptional components. Everything is kind of purified and ready for you. All you need to do is add a DNA template. Um, what we found was that we we really needed to boost our signal. And a, one way we did that was utilizing our freeze-drying process lyophilization as a way to actually concentrate a cell-free system. So normally when you get a cell-free system, it comes to you in liquid form, and um, that's pretty much it. it you, you have it at 1x, and it, it does your reaction for you. By freeze-drying it, so you freeze-dry a larger amount, and when you rehydrate it using the same volume for all of these, you can actually concentrate all of that into a much higher concentration that you normally have in a pure reaction. And when we did that, we found that these concentrated rehydrated reactions actually gave us a faster output by uh, 15 minutes. And 15 minutes might not seem like a lot, but in terms of the regimes we're operating in for these wearable systems that are very, very poor, uh, 15 minutes means a lot to us. Um, and so as you can see here at 1x pure, you're getting your, your reaction completely done right around 45 minutes. Um, and when you start to increase that to about 1.5x concentration, um, it boosts it by 15 minutes. And now your reaction is, is done by 30 minutes um, because you have more components. Things potentially might be working faster because of uh, a crowding, molecular crowding for example. Um, but if you concentrate it too much, what you end up having is that the, the, um, it goes back down um, to where we were before. And so if you concentrate it too much, um, the efficiency drops. And we think that's happening because at, at sufficiently high concentrations, things are crashing out of solution. And we think we can optimize this so that um, you actually have extremely high sulfur concentrations and things are still in solution, and you have a highly uh, crowded, molecular crowded uh, solution. And so what we want to do is we want to take this highly concentrated cell-free system using lyophilization and put that into uh, work for us as artificial cell engineering system. And so uh, this is kind of one thing that we're kind of looking at right now, the next thing that we want to do. And so this is not this is really using our cell-free system uh, and the freeze-drying aspect as a way to concentrate all of the components of the cell-free system so that you're approaching the concentrations uh, of what's in a cell, a normal living cell, in an artificial cell system. Um, and so now what you would normally have in an artificial cell is pretty dilute. What if we could pack it with very, very concentrated amounts of sulfate systems. Can we, you know, reach a threshold where we're actually doing interesting things with artificial cells? Um, we're, 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 if you think about it, uh, we're kind of priming the pump at at 
the, the best possible case now by packing in a lot into these artificial cells. And so we're kind of exploring on what we could do in this area. We're definitely looking for collaborators because we're not artificial cell uh, labs. We're, we're definitely not a laboratory that does artificial cells. Uh, nobody at the V's right now does artificial cells, but it's something that we're very interested in exploring. Um, and it's something we want to get our feet wet in. And that's that's definitely something um, that uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to, to kind of give this presentation is to see if we could uh, find collaborators that we could work with in, in that area. Um, so again, we have expertise in selfie systems, and this is where we're interested in going next. Um, so with that, it, sorry, I think uh, I want to leave some time for questions, so I'm going to end it there. Um, and this is all the people that have worked on all of those papers, um, all of the different funding agencies that have uh, funded the various projects throughout the years. So I've kind of showed things since uh, 2014, uh, which is a lot of different work that has been published. Um, and with that, I think I'll uh, I'll open it up for any questions you guys might have. And I, I do have some questions here on the chat. I think I'll go ahead and just go through the chat. So I see Kate. Please. Not... Yep, please yeah. do. And if you could read the question before you answer it, that's going to work for people who will watch the recording. Yes, OK. So uh, Eva asked, is this an E. coli extract? So for our selfie systems, we, yes, we mainly work with E. coli just because out of everything that's commercially available, that is the, the one that everybody uses. So we, we typically gravitate towards NEB pure. That's the system we use because it's the most well-behaved. Although we do, we have used a pure self-free, uh, sorry, we have used self-free extracts that you get directly from the cells in-house. So we work with the Jewett Lab a lot. They were our partners on the BioBits kits and they use, they're the, they are the masters at doing self-free extracts. Um, one thing I should mention is the self-free freeze-dried part um, that has been tested in different different other extracts. So we've tested that with yeast extracts. It works just fine. We've even tested it with human mammalian extracts. So we did a HeLa extract and that worked surprisingly well as well. Uh, so you can use the freeze dried aspect, aspect with any kind of self free extract, it seems, and it works when you rehydrate it. Um, how does the yield and freeze dried system compares with yields and fresh extract? Um, so the freeze dried system yields. Um, so this is by Carlos looking at the oh, sorry, guys, I. Um, so we do get a hit in the fresh versus freeze dried system when the hits about 25 to 30 percent. And one of the problems is it's highly variable between people and between labs. We have had issues where we've had above 50% drop in activity. And most of the time we can drill it down to something happening during the lyophilization step. Either somebody else coming on and putting something on the lyophilizer and ruining the, the whole, the, the amount of vacuum that it's holding. Um, but roughly around 20% hit is what you can expect. And that's for unoptimized systems um, where you, you, you haven't optimized it for lyophilization, which we haven't. Michael asks, does BioBits kits come with DNA or can the user supply their own? So most of the kits come with their own DNA, but you can contact BioBits and you can get the self-free extracts alone without DNA and just add them in. Um, Tanner asks, what happens if you wash the fabric? So that's a great question. For the fabrics that have the selfie systems into them, obviously they have to be exposed to the environment. If that you wash them or they get exposed to water, for example, uh, it rains, you're outside in the rain, then basically the system is kaput. It doesn't work anymore. So that's, that's an obvious practical limitation of this, this whole system. Um, and that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. The temperature limit of these clothing sensors. Um, so the temperature limit we have found, uh, Brian asks for these temp temperature limits. 
These sulfate systems, they'll work for up to 40 degrees centigrade. That's right around when they start to peter out and not work anymore. Um, sorry for the noise, uh, if you guys can hear the background. Um, but uh, so the, yeah, 40 degrees is the temperature limit. So if you're wearing this and right now you're in Seattle or pretty much anywhere in the central US, it's probably wouldn't work after a while because the, this, the system would get degraded. So you can't wear this uh, in 45 degree centigrade weather, uh, for example, it probably won't work. For the fast mask face mask indicator, what's the cost per unit? Uh, as I mentioned before, it's $5. And uh, that's from a breakdown of the cost of goods from our prototype. Um, and we've had a lot of interest in people uh, wanting to commercialize it. And so we kind of looked at how much we can knock the cost down. And we think we can get it down to below a dollar from that. Anna Marie asks, what kind of extract? Um, again, it's the NEB uh, pure, pure extract. Um, and one other thing I want to mention is the NAB pure extract. Uh, for those of you that might be developing this for potential commercial applications, um, I think the patent is going offline this year. So the patent for that is going offline, and you're probably going to see the NEB, the pure system, it's called the pure system, um, being manufactured and sold by a lot of other different uh, people. Uh, in the US, it was limited to NEB. They had the license for that, but you'll be able to find it for everywhere, everything for a lot of other um, companies now. Um, is it possible to freeze dry other extracts? Yes, uh, we covered that already. Uh, Taysuk mentioned optimization of concentrations. Would it be an art because of batch to batch variability of cell free extracts? Yes. Um, so that is very much an art right now. Uh, so just doing cell free reactions in general, uh, we see a lot of variation between even our own collaborators. So we collaborated with the Jewett lab that does their own batch to batch. Uh, they do their own cell free extract at in house. We tried to do it do that as well. And when you do the results from a sensor, for example, we would get different results. And it got to the point where we had to actually fly uh, two of our graduate students over to Northwestern to actually walk through the entire process with the Jewett lab and replicate it back in our lab. So we had to like fly them over there, put them up in a hotel, just to have this, uh, just, just to reduce that variation in, in variability. Um, and so it's these little things in the process if you're doing it yourself. And that's one of the reasons why I would recommend using the NAB Pure system, because that one is optimized uh, in-house at, at NEB, and we see uh, less variability in batch-to-batch -batch kits, for example. Um, but yeah, in-house extracts are much cheaper. They're like 10 times cheaper than what you could buy it for. And the wearables, are they single use or is it possible to replace a freeze-dried sulfur extract? That's something that a lot of people are interested in. And Jim is actually interested in, in having something modular that you can put in. But right now, the way the wearables are designed, their wearables are designed for single use. Um, and the idea is if you were contaminated with something, you probably don't want to reuse your, you know, your protective gear um, because it's already contaminated. Once it senses something, um, then you throw it away. Um, and so that is kind of very common for, you know, uh, a bodysuit, for example, that gets contaminated with something. Even if you don't know what it is, you throw it away anyway because of what it might be. Um, yeah, so uh, another comment, I guess, is the the cheap prices and commercialization aspect. And yeah, I think if you guys do research uh, into a lot of people looking into the pure system, which is, I didn't go into the details of that, but the pure system is unlike the in-house system, You the, the components that you need for transcription and translation are all purified away from everything else. And so it's basically just recombinant 40, proteins uh, and a bunch of other things that they put into it. So it's all recombined into a, a, a reaction that's very defined. It's a very defined reaction. And so that used to be quite expensive. 
Um, and a lot of people now are looking into reducing that and actually doing that in-house by putting all of the different 40 or plus genes onto one plasmid and expressing that in-house. And they've been able to get the costs down uh, significantly from what you can buy it for. Um, and so there, these papers were just published in the past two or three years. Uh, is If you just kind of look up uh, recombinant pure systems, um, there's several papers where people have looked at that. And so you can do pure in-house if you want. Um, we have the, the, the plasmids for that, and we're looking into that uh, as well. Um, and so with that, if there are no any other questions, I think I'll I'll end there. If you guys have any other uh, questions for us or you know interest in collaborating, please just go ahead and email me. We're we're, we're very happy to jump on another Zoom and and just brainstorm about what to do. Um, or if there are any other emails about where to buy things or what to do for certain experiments, I'd be more than happy to help if you just email me. Thank you very much. Um... I really appreciate the talk and I share the sentiment about reproducibility. We're having the same issues. Um, thank you and thanks Absolutely. everyone. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks everyone. And see you all next week. Bye. Bye.